All right. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person. If you guys are listening to this, obviously you found the instructions to go and check Canvas and uh, listen to this, um, I guess we'll call it a podcast, screencast, I think. Okay. Um, so uh, you should have your red packets out and um, we're in topic 2.2 and we're going to go through uh, the... Uh, stuff that we didn't get to uh, yesterday and the day before, and we're going to finish this out and then possibly get into uh, 2.3 as well. But anyway, uh, here's the outline. Um, and as a quick review, so here's the uh, College Board outline. By design, different structures, powers, and functions of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives reflect policymaking process. Okay, so the, we've talked a lot about how the structure of the House uh, being that it's so large is fundamentally different to have two-year elections uh, than the Senate, where they have um, six-year staggered elections, where the Senate is never 100% up for re-election at any one time. Talked about how <clears throat> committees, the committee system in the House is really important, and uh, if you chair a committee in the House, you actually could have a similar amount of power that an individual senator could have. And then this is stuff we really didn't get into. Chamber-specific rules and roles that impact policymaking include the number of chamber and debate rules that set a high bar for building majority support. So that's really referring to the filibuster closure uh, aspect of the Senate. Uh, the role of the speaker, and remember we said the role of the speaker is really to smooth the pathway for legislation, pathway for legislation and to appoint committee chairs more than anything and make sure they're in line and following the party agenda. The president of the Senate is the vice president of the United States and does not play a leadership role. So party leadership is really uh, in the Senate side, the majority leader. And of course, committee leadership is very important, in both the House and Senate, although a little more so in the House, just because uh, leading a committee is an opportunity to have a direct role in the policymaking process. Okay, and also we talked a lot about filibuster and closure. A hold is the modern iteration of a filibuster. And unanimous consent, we didn't really talk about in every class, but I will mention that with uh, everyone listening right now. A unanimous consent agreement is something that occurs in the Senate where, as the name suggests, if everybody agrees, then you can proceed forward and that would prohibit members of the Senate from instituting a filibuster or a hold. So it's a way to fast track legislation. We'll talk more about that in a minute when we go through the, through the notes. Okay. Uh, the rules committee, the committee of the whole discharge petitions. We'll talk about those here in a little bit. And uh, the budget process, very important and uh, pork barreling, which we already talked about and we'll go through these definitions. So, um, this is all review from the other day, so we don't need to go through all this stuff. Uh, just a real quick, uh, for those of you that may have missed uh, because of being sick. Uh, and yes, you can probably tell by my voice, that's why I am not uh, at school today. So anyway, uh, the real leaders of Congress, again, the committee chairs, and the role of the speaker is really to uh, make sure that the people appointed to committees are, are following the party's agenda more than anything else. Leadership is de determined by majority status and seniority. So seniority is very important. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Okay. And all this stuff, uh, I use the example of uh, the markup session for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And if you recall from class, uh, the drummer for the band Metallica was testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee because of the threat that Napster posed to their business model. So they were trying to, so that's an example of a hearing and later on a markup session where they determine the needs of an industry and, and what kind of legislative solution might be required uh, to, to fix it. And during that process, of course, there's amendments and earmarks. This is all during the committees, by the way. All this stuff is uh, what happens at committees. If a, if a committee chair doesn't like a bill, he can pigeonhole it and try to prevent it from being uh, voted out of the committee. And if leadership doesn't like that, they can file a discharge petition. So again, review from yesterday. Okay, 
this is stuff we did not go over yet, so we'll kind of slow down here a little bit and get into this. Uh, in the House, there are three leadership positions. A speaker, who currently is Nancy Pelosi. And just to give you a little tour of the leadership positions, here is the speaker, Nancy Pelosi. She is the one uh, holding the gavel. And we have the, oh, look, there he is, Steny Hoyer, who is the majority leader, and he looks kind of ragged. Um, doesn't really do a whole lot with Nancy in charge. Nancy rules with, a, with an iron fist, but he's there to kind of rally the troops. Uh, and then there's also the majority whip. Now, the majority whip's job is to really work the phones and make sure that everybody in the Democratic Party is fully supportive of the party agenda. And we also have the minority leader, currently Kevin McCarthy, who will probably be the next speaker if the Republicans win, as the polls seem to be uh, indicating could likely happen uh, come 2023. And then um, Steve Scalise is the House uh, Minority Whip, or also called the Republican Whip. And uh, just a little bit of trivia, this is the guy who survived an assassination attempt. He was There was the... Uh, uh, what's supposed to be a nice civic uh, gathering, the uh, House Republicans and Democrats play each other in, in a game of baseball, and somebody ambushed them, and he got shot uh, with a high-powered rifle. It's an absolute miracle he survived, but anyway, it's a little bit more than you need to know. So getting back to the notes then, uh, the House majority and minority leaders are just uh, little cogs in the leadership wheel, so to speak, that are uh, there to assist the speaker and the house minority uh leader and the house minority whip are kind of you know they're obviously partisan leaders for the republican party currently since the republican party is the minority party uh for now uh and most likely those people will move up so i would assume the minority whip steve scalise will take the role of the majority leader if kevin mccarthy becomes uh, once again, uh, here's the imagery to help you with that. Uh, there, there they are. Uh, so this is probably your next speaker, this guy right here. Uh, but, you know, who knows? The uh, Republican Party has been known to surprise. They put, after all, um, people like this in charge. This is Paul Ryan, who is uh, not anywhere or close to a senior member of Congress, and they put him in there. And by the way, you made the foolish decision to pose for a time magazine they said hey oh, here you work out why don't you uh, pick up some weights and so they did so he they made him uh <clears throat> if i was in classes where i'd make my lame um house of reps get it because he's working out there yep yep there you go bad pun okay back to work Okay, next up is a very important topic incumbency so what is an incumbent somebody who already holds office is an incumbent the advantage of incumbency are numerous. So I guess I can type some of them out here since I've got the computer right here. So uh, one, um, we'll just call it famili familiarity. Oh, never mind, I'm not going to do that. That's going to take too long. Uh, familiarity. So people know who they are. They have a record of accomplishment. Um, if you were in class the other day, you might remember me talking about the freeway exchange so this was the ribbon cutting ceremony in a little promotional video that they put out celebrating this uh, uh, newly constructed interchange with uh, federal dollars. So if you are an incumbent, you can take credit for stuff like that. And of course, that's a big deal. Other advantages of incumbency. Well, uh, name recognition. If people know who you are, you've proven you can win. If you've already won election one time. And it tends to be much, much easier to raise money. Uh, so you have a financial advantage that's enormous. Uh, later in the course, we're going to talk about something called the invisible primary, where uh, in the selection process between within the party, so Republicans and Democrats have to pick among themselves before they run against the opposite party. And if you have uh, name recognition, uh, you've already won the biggest uh difficulty that new candidates face is what is getting your name out there in the media and stuff like that uh and there's some other ones that are less well known one is called the franking privilege f-r-a-n-k franking 
which is the free use of the uh, United States Postal Service. So that's a big advantage um, as well. Um, and also, if you win elected office, one of the things we're going to talk about today, you also likely benefit from uh, gerrymandering, um, which is designed to foster uh, predictable outcomes of elections. So we'll talk more about that later. Why is the incumbency advantage stronger in the House than in the Senate? Because of what I just mentioned. Members of the House, especially in a state like Texas, uh, have a much, much higher likelihood of getting reelected simply because of the way the districts are drawn. And let me pop over to the internet and show you that real quick. So these are the proposed, uh, this is the proposed congressional redistricting map for Texas. We gained representatives. And as you can see from this website, um, the old map had, you know, one, two, three, four, I don't know, about, looks like about 10 or 11 um, solid Republican districts and about, looks like eight solid Democrat districts, but quite a few toss ups. The new map is almost entirely either Republican or Democrat. They don't even, you know, it's, they're not even trying to have competitive elections. And that's because it's to the advantage of states to um, have members of Congress get reelected because once they get reelected, then they start to accumulate more power and get better committee assignments. And then they can do stuff like what's next on the outline, which is pork barrel spending and credit claiming. And once again, here is uh, John Culberson literally in the act of credit claiming. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but uh, so there they are cutting the ribbon and taking credit for building that project with everybody else's money. Okay, so it doesn't get any more uh, obvious than that, that they're trying to uh, claim credit. Uh, okay, so there, there's an example. So in, in other words, when a politician says, look what I built you guys um, with federal money, and keep in mind when it's federal money, the state of Texas is not paying for it. And of course, we like that uh, here in the state of Texas. Okay, so um, we're going to have a little uh, discussion. Well, we'll call it a discussion. I'm going to speak to you about this uh, dilemma faced by new members of Congress and the advantages of incumbents and the importance of re-election. So we already kind of talked about this, but but um, this is titled The Committee System and Its Consequences. So here's the, sh uh, the big picture. Okay, if you've been paying attention in the class, this should look familiar. This is the list of congressional uh, committees. And every one of these people that chairs the committee has a tremendous amount of power over that particular policy area. And some policy areas, some committees are really, really good ones to be on, like appropriations. Appropriations means spending. Okay, so to get on a committee, you have to get elected several times to where you have the kind of experience uh, to where you're actually, um, you know, considered valuable to the party. So, um, so as you can see, this person is... Ah, let's say it looks like been there a while and, um, you know, same, you, know, you don't find any um, AOCs on the chairmanships of committees. They're usually fairly elderly um, <clears throat> or middle-aged. It's not too old, looks like. But you can see there, uh, been in power since 2003, so that means he's been elected like, I don't know, you do the math. <laughs> okay. Uh, budget committee, um, yeah, no surprise there. Been there since 2007. Uh, budget committee here since 2013. That's kind of surprising. So he's maybe violates that a little bit, but he's a, he's a not a leader. He's a, he's just the um, the guy uh, on on the ranking member. So the minority party we call it the ranking member. The chairman is the member. Always remember remember this of the majority party. And if we could just look at some other ones here, um, just for fun. Um, there's energy and commerce. Yeah, uh, <laughs> elected in 1988. Good lord. Um, and uh, she looks rather, I don't, doesn't say when she's elected, but again, not the, not the leader, just the uh, ranking member. So uh, we'll see. But, uh, and of course, there's people like Maxine Waters, who's been there forever. Um, <clears throat> I don't know who this guy is, but uh, 1998. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> there's another one, 1993. So, you know, Mike McCall, 2005. Anyway, you get the idea. So herein lies the difficulty. Members of Congress, uh, when they first get elected, they have to really start playing the power game, which means they have to spend time in Washington, D.C. So how are you supposed to be an effective member of Congress 
and know the needs of your district if you're always in Washington, D.C. And so you have to kind of what I call play the power game. And that, in, that means, you know, meeting with lobbyists, doing all the things that you have to do to increase your power. And, of course, focusing on reelection. Now, what role do the state legislatures play in this? Okay, so let's go back to this map and take a look at what this really means if we look at this data, okay? Um, this, this is a uh, proposed uh, map, and I don't know if it's going to let us click on the old one or not, but uh, let me hang on and get over to another part of this website. Okay, so this is the Nate Silver blog, um, the 538 blog, I should say. Nate Silver is a statistician. He's, if you're into sports and anything where statistics is important, uh, including politics, it's a pretty good website. So this 538 website, pretty cool. Um, but anyway, uh, you can see that um, the only states where you see competitive elections, which are represented by these purple colors, okay, uh, are in smaller states. Um, and... Uh, Otherwise, they're either red or they're blue, and they're usually a dark shade of each, okay? So of the 435 seats out there, only 72 nationwide are even are considered competitive. 